Gotcha. Hello, everybody. James here. This is second episode of whatever this podcast is with Shane Douglas. We still haven't named it yet, and uh, just for continuity's sake, we still haven't got a name for this podcast. I mean, we're wearing the same T-shirts that we did last week as well. So, uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, we've been sat here for a week smelling terrible just to bring this next podcast coming to you. Uh, we are going to be talking about Barely Legal, the first ECW pay-per-view, the actual pay-per-view itself. And the first question I've got for you, Shane, I'm sorry, I'm really launching into this, I realise this. No, fine. But, um, yeah, let's roll. But uh, we, uh, we don't have that much in the way of time anyway so we've got to rush through um first thing is first the ring for barely legal it seems to me a brand new ring it's got its completely unique sound to it it's got a big clattering sound to it um it makes a great impactful noise but it also looked quite bouncy uh i don't know if you remember this particular ring or if you're noticing while you're watching barely legal eight days ago yeah. as we wink yeah. as we were yeah this. yeah the uh the the rings as i recall the, the the newer rings that would become the ecw ring they were made on a by a company out in long island prior to that there were one or two different rings like it, it might be a different ring from the last arena show uh and it was quite hard but on the show that night you can't tell because of all the people the days before the days leading up to the pay-per-view the entire ecw crew was in there sweeping the floors, painting, covering, you know, getting the building up to snuff. So it didn't quite look as bingo hollish as it had prior. And the ring being brand new, uh, the, it, the ECW ring that, that, that will say this ring moving forward. Excuse me. I apologize. Hmm. My morning coffee from last, from eight days ago. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, uh, they, uh, it, it was a great ring to work in. Uh, really, really uh, safe. Uh, the, the, this ring had it was the first time I'd ever worked in a ring outside of one of the big companies. That the 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 subfloor, which is plywood, actually had each of the cross plates. On. I keep um, sooner or later I'll get used to this whole setup. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. But are we still in a pl- good place here? Can you? Oh yeah, yeah, well? yeah. You're fine. You carry on. The uh, the subfloor. The, the first of all, there was a rim around the edge that would hold, you know, so if you capital, if you enlarged it, the piece of plywood sort of sat in like this. So it wouldn't fly out and pop up. Com- additionally, in each of the corners, there were cross plates on the under uh, girding of, of the rings, all steel suspension rings prior to that had uh, uh, like a, a railroad spring or some big spring in the middle. These were what's called a suspension ring where, which probably is the reason for the more of the, the bouncy look, uh, where those plywoods would then lay down and where they met, there was an iron plate underneath that had screw holes cut through. And we would take a flathead nut and roll it down through. So that entire subfloor was bolted down. So the boards couldn't pop out like it happens so often in, in say, independent rings or smaller promotions. It also had the half inch of uh, of what it would be termed for la- lack of a better uh, word, or maybe there's an official word for it. It was a foam padding, sort of like a carpet padding. That was a half inch thick. Uh, the fans, when they ever get to feel the ring, they'll say, oh, I thought it was a lot softer than that. Um, and, or, you know, or, or they ask about like the bounce of the ring. They, in their heads, a lot of fans think it's sort of like a trampoline type of thing. And really, it's not. It, the reason it's not, and the reason that it doesn't have six inches of padding on it, is when we're running, if you look at the bottom of a wrestling boot, I wish I had one here, uh, they're smooth. There's no tread on it. So if you know, when, if you've ever been to an outdoor show and it starts to rain, you see while well, the wrestlers are on ice skates. That's why because they have no tread on their on their on the bottom. The reason for that is so that we can glide along the ring. So that as we're running the ropes or whatever, that we have we like our, our the, the, there's no traction that say catches and and like if you want to twist and turn, you could blow your knee out. Uh, it's the, 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 everything that is in a wrestling ring today is there for a reason. The way it's set up, like it's set up, the way that there's the give. Not so much in ECW was being Land of the Giants, but when you go like say like imagine WWE with a Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant or you know four of these monsters in the ring, you start taking bumps. Especially remember like the bump that uh uh that Chris uh uh, uh gotta get with the names uh <laughs> wrestling Hulk Hogan uh King Kong Bundy uh, and you know taking that huge bump off the top of the cage. If that were just a solidly welded ring pretty likely some of those welds are going to break you know because metal doesn't give and it doesn't flex 
So the, the reason the ring has that little bit of the give is so that it doesn't break on the welds and things like that, especially through the course of night, how many bumps and how many big guys take falls in the ring and everything else. So that ring, I believe, was built at a company out on Long Island near where the House of Hardcore was, the, the, the ECW training center. And Mikey was the conduit to that for some reason. Um, so like when I got the House of Hardcore 2 in Pittsburgh, Mikey was who delivered the ring. And it was the exact same ring as it was used in the arena or the house shows uh, later for ECW. A fantastic ring. And I think now uh, the the House of Hardcore 2 ring is is uh, owned by one of the promoters out near in, in the uh, – uh, Lank, not Lancaster, uh, in the outskirts of Philadelphia area. Um, and I'm sure there's still plenty of them floating around because there were four or five of them all together, I think. They were then, I think, $6,000 per ring. And, and, you know, that was an expensive ring in 1997. So uh, I think if you look at that, you can see that in, in, in whatever way ECW could, in preparing for this launch on pay-per-view, we were trying to get it as much up to snuff as we could with a professional the professional look of the building as much as possible, the brand new ring. And to want to give the impression that this is, yes, this is still ECW. We're still in the same building. These are still the same wrestlers, but we're upgraded a bit. It's ECW 2.0. Uh, leaving ECW out of it, let's just go for the uh, main territories or promotions you work for. Who had the best ring? Who had the worst? And why? I'd say the ECW ring. Uh, the NWA, I used to love their ring. The problem with it was... They had, if you go back and watch the old NWA tapes, when people hit the ring, the ropes, you'll hear this clack, 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 yeah. clack sound. Uh, that's because they had a piece of like rubber tubing over a cable. Vince McMahon, WWE has always used the real ropes. Um, well, well, that I actually am, leads me to that. Do you prefer cable or real ropes? Cable. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why I was just going to tell say that. Uh, uh, several instances. First of all, the ropes have a lot more sponginess to them. Not that they're loose. But when you hit a real rope, it can, you know, you sort of go and go and go before you get the bounce back. The cable much less gives you come. It gives you a lot more uh, momentum in shooting you off the off the rope, uh, off the cable in that, uh, in that instant. Uh, early in our career, Dominic had us up in uh, upstate New York. And I, as I recall, it was me and Dominic versus, I think, Dave Klebanski and Mick Foley. And uh, they're in the ring crisscrossing. And I'm watching Mick. You know, as he's going side to side, and you know, like when you're when you're seeing two guys crisscross, you're sort of like your focus is going to center ring, and so your peripheral vision is catching them hitting the ropes. I see Mick hit the ropes, and I blink my eye, and Mick's gone. He's disappeared, like he's just like <laughs> abracadabra. He's not there. And a split, a, a millionth of a second later, I hear, but <laughs> and and just instinctively reacted to it. You know, like something went by my head. What had happened was that rope, it was an actual rope ring. Uh, when Mick hit the rope, the rope, the turnbuckle itself had let loose the threads. And so that turnbuckle is what, again, went slot flying by my head. Had it been another inch or so, but it, but it killed me. Uh, but Mick, because of the way Dominic had taught us to hit the ropes, you know, the first thing he did, his body instinctively tightened up and that locked the rope under his arm and allowed his body to pivot. And he had otherwise he'd hit on the top of his head. When you see something that happened, it happened so quickly and could have been so catastrophic that that leaves an indelible mark that you don't quite easily forget about. And so, like, when I was in the WWF working in those rings, there was always an apprehension in hitting those ropes that would the threads let loose, would the rope let go. Typically, no, because, you know, pretty much they're changing those ropes pretty often. It's fresh rope uh, that, that's underneath there you know, with tape over it. Uh, at least the rings that I used to work for. I don't know what they have now. I haven't been there for years. Uh, but the cable, the, the the clattering sound, but there's a little bit more danger to that because back in the day when I, my knees were still good, I used to do what, you know, you have the heel beat on me, turnbuckle and shoot me. I would vault to the top turnbuckle and do a blind cross body block. One particular night, I think we were in, it was either the Omni in Atlanta or, or building close by. Uh, we were working Midnight Express and Bobby Eaton shot me, and I went to do that. Well, when my foot hit the top rope, instead of the, hit the corner of the turnbuckle, but the top rope, that plastic spun. And so my foot just like shot straight through. And I, again, I'm going to get used to this. I have people at home, so I don't keep on kicking things. But, uh, and, you know, it's, boom, and I'm upside down landing the ropes. So there was a, you know, there's no way to really plan for that. Like you can't say, okay, how can I safeguard against that? 
Uh, sometimes they spun, other times they might be taped and not spin. So it was a crapshoot. And that clacking sound that would that you get from off the ring, I, I never was fond of. The smaller territories, like I said earlier, the boards would often come loose. A lot of times they're like uh, two by 12s that lay next to each other. And when one of those comes up and hits you in the head, it can be dangerous. Mm. Also, when you're running the ropes, as those things are bouncing, when you're subconsciously, again, I can touch my nose without even thinking about it because we've done it 10 million times, right? It's called proprioceptors in your arm. When you're running the ropes, the same thing. Your body knows exactly where your toe is going to hit and where you're going to take your next step and, and keep running, keep the momentum going. If the ring is going like this or the boards are going like this, your brain thinks that you're hitting floor. And if it's a second, you know, an inch or two below that, and then it comes up and meets, it could blow your knee ligaments out, can you know break your leg, break a bone. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the ring. So that said, I, again, I think the ECW rings that that would become the ring that would become the ECW ring from barely legal forward were incredibly professional rings. Uh, the sound was different from previous, but if you look at the later tapes and ECW, and part of the most iconic matches you remember watching in ECW, it has that sort of same feel and sound. Uh, and because you mentioned Bailey Legal, we're finally going to talk about the pay per view after what? I mean, crikey, we've been talking <laughs> for about two hours, really, but, uh, yes. you know, recording for at least a, a, an hour and 35 or whatever. And uh, the dark matches Lou Spicoli, Pins, Balls, Mahoney, JT Smith, and Chris Chetty defeat Little Guido and Tommy Rich. We could. We, I'm sure we could do a whole episode on just those six guys, but we won't. We will uh, move on. And the opening of the pay per view is Joey Styles welcoming us to the show. Now, I was speaking to Chris beforehand, and he wanted to make... Uh, he said that you had more stuff about Joey Styles and just his professionalism as far yeah. as... I think something went wrong in the ring, and I think it was actually the Lance Storm-Rob Van Dam match, and you were making mention of just how professionally Joey covered up for that. Before we talk about that, just one second. Um, Paul Heyman had to fight to keep his own director and cameraman on the uh, pay-per-view, as well as Joey Styles to remain solo on commentary. Yes, uh, Tommy Dreamer comes out for the main events. He might as well have not been there. He didn't say anything. And right. um, <laughs> uh, Did you prefer Joey on his own, or did you prefer him with a co-commentator like Taz or Cyrus? Uh, Joey was fantastic either way. I, there, I had never seen the individual announcer calling the whole thing. No color guy to play off of. And when you you know, you come from the paradigm of a color guy and the, and the, uh, the, the play-by-play guy calling the match. There's a banter that goes on back and forth. You know, the best at it were Bobby Heenan and, 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 uh, uh, Jesse Ventura, obviously uh, they were phenomenal at that and playing off that back and forth. But to have Joey Styles, you know, like the reason we had Joey Styles with no color guy was in the earliest days, we couldn't afford a color guy. <laughs> and so, uh, but Joey was, uh, I, and this but by no means is to be to smear or besmirch anybody else in the industry. Jim Ross was phenomenal. Uh, Lance Russell, phenomenal. Gordon Soley, phenomenal. They were great at what they did. But watching Joey, uh, how professionally he approached this job uh, in the dressing room walking around, I remember him talking with Taz about the Kata Hajime. And in, in his commentary on Barely Legal, you'll hear him just like during the uh, the, the, the Mishinoku match, you, you hear him just throwing these these words out that I'd never heard before. Uh, you know, he had done his homework. I, you, you know, like the like the straight A student in class, Joey had done his homework, and he knew all of this stuff. But he also laid it out in a way that he didn't sound like the beanhead, like lecturing you. Uh, and and you know, all the euphemisms, the oh my gods, and the uh, you know the the close calls on the two three counts. Uh, just those little things that he did so so professionally and so well. That you don't realize it, but he's elevating the excitement in the match. You know, you're you're paying attention. Your eyes are watching what's on the screen. This guy you don't see is talking about this and just elevating it. Uh, but I again, I would remember seeing him in the dressing room and oftentimes coming to me and saying, "Hey, you know, when at this point of the match, like, what are you planning on doing?" And uh, he was really digging into it and and understanding it on more than just a "Hey, let's sit down and call what we're seeing on the monitor here." Uh, you know, again, helping, uh, coming up with, uh, the, the Kata Hajime and things like that. Joey w was pretty much an athlete, you know, and, and uh, uh, had, had been quite involved in things uh, when he was in high school and younger. Uh, and, and he brought with him, a, a, you know, a, 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 a corporate attitude, you know, they had worked for big companies in New York city. And so brought that sort of with him. And, and again, like to me, Joey's delivery was so, so 
informative, but at the same time, so disarming. It wasn't like, hey, I'm a beanhead here. And I know these big words I'm going to just keep hitting you over the head with. Uh, you know, he, he just drew you into it. And, and to me, that professionalism, the fact that he had didn't have a color guy to bounce off and <laughs> catch his breath or, you know, let some other perspective in and just boom, 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 just keep on going with that. There's never a sense in Joey's commentary where you feel like hey, he's talking too much or what he's saying doesn't really mean anything, or he's just filling time. It just keeps on, it keeps advancing this, the story that's being told. And, and that ain't an easy thing to do. Uh, I, I've watched Joey both as, you know, the single guy doing, you know, the play by play and straight through and providing his own color. And I've also had the privilege of sitting next to him and, and being his color guy. And, uh, his professionalism, I'd never seen that anywhere else in the business. I'm not saying that any of those other guys I mentioned earlier were not professional, but with Joey, like we would sit down and talk like on the, on the run through when we did the pay-per-view from Dayton, Ohio the night before, as they're doing the, the walkthrough and for all the timing and stuff, Joey's both paying attention to what's going on in the arena and they're doing the walk through, but also having a discussion with me. Okay. And then at this point, we're going to drop out and let this package play. And I, he was just like a really hands-on full director. Uh, and he also, you know, there's when you've worked with somebody, like, like, I'm sure with you with Dutch, it, it comes at a point where uh, you, you need to get used to each other's inflections and, and knowing where this is going to drop off and when it's time for you to, to come on in or when it's time to just let it breathe. You know, Joey made me look very good in that because I had never done that before. And there were a few times early on where I would step on him because it sounded to me like he had stopped and I was ready to say something. So he got to the point uh, uh, very, very early we were doing the, when I was doing color with him where he would tap my hand to let me know that he had finished. And then that let me know, like, give a second to breathe and I can pop in. Or if he wanted something to pause, he would put his hand on top of my hand. Let it breathe. Okay, now we can go ahead and, let, and step into it. Just those little directions for a week or two got me to the point where I was up and running with Joey. So he really was uh, instrumental in the success of ECW, both the, the delivery on camera as what you're listening to on the soundtrack, but also ramping that excitement up and doing it in a way that really had not been done in professional wrestling before. Uh, was he somebody who was like a vociferous note taker and, you know, had like pages that, you know, the paper that thick on his desk or was it all up, at, all up there? All up here. Yeah, I never saw, he was always walking around with, you know, like with maybe the rundown sheet or whatever. And I'm sure he must have written a note down someplace here or there. But no, Joe would commit it to memory and have it. You know, he was, uh, you know, I guess like a rain man in that sense. <laughs> the, the idiot savant. <laughs> we uh, will go to the opening match. Joe Styles welcomes us to the show. His microphone sound is coming through the PA, so you can barely hear him. At least uh, the version I watched. I watched a WWE Network okay. version you had. Uh, I sent you... After I'd watched the network version, I sent you the one with the original music and everything. So um, anyway, ECW <laughs> Tag Team Champions, the Dudley Boys, and Sign Guy Dudley, who was uh, Louis Dangerously afterwards, and Joel Gertner interrupts. And the belts, this is immediately what I noticed when I watched this. The, the belts were the old, the tag belts, the old WWF intercontinental knockoff belts that they just probably like scrolled in pencil, you know, tag team champions or something, <laughs> and they made it out of like silver instead of gold. Yeah. Um, I've got, I've got it here. It just says, give me a story on Joel Gertner. I know he listens to, um, or he did listen, I think to the Dutch Mantel show. So I think hopefully he still yeah. listens, but yeah, uh, a Joel Gertner story. Why not? Uh, Joel, you know, Joel came into the dressing room. He was very, very young. Right. Uh, you know, obviously you could look at him and see that he was not an athlete. Uh, but, you know, we started hearing these these stories, and I can't say that I've ever confirmed any of them, but I'd heard, uh, and I forget if it was from Paul or somebody in the dressing room, that he had uh, he was in the Ivy League. He had come out of one of the Ivy League schools, uh, hadn't graduated, he quit to come work for ECW, which I think is a, you know, a pretty big testament to his commitment to the business. He's phenomenal on the microphone, phenomenal in building the heat and doing it in a way that's that's entertaining, uh, it's not, you know, my, mine's sort of a way of more pissing you off. His was the a way that draws you into the story. And there's going to be some punchline at the end that has you slip on the banana peel. Uh, and, and the little euphemisms, the well, 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 and all of that, it was so different in ECW. It was a, such a different style that, uh, you know, putting him out there and then with the neck brace on and, you know, the, he, you know, his, the, his, the body that he had then and you know his young baby face uh it's it so lent itself because he did come across like that guy like he's going to lecture you but he's going to give it to you in euphemisms and, and these these stories that sort of draw you in uh 
And when talking to him, you can tell that he's an extremely intelligent guy. Uh, Joel has always, he was never, uh, nobody in the dressing room was like the ass kissing guy that came in. I'm going to kiss ass and get a, get ahead here. Uh, but Joel was sort of like in the dressing room and like sort of knew his place. And I know that sounds sort of condescending, but in the wrestling dressing room, there is always a hierarchy, right? Uh, and so you come in and you realize that you're the guy that, okay, time for you to sit over there and be quiet and listen, pay attention and learn. And then a time to start coming forward. And, and Joel came in and sort of just seamlessly fit into that. We have a, uh, uh, when we did the 97 pay-per-view in, in Pittsburgh, uh, there was a, in my hometown of New Brighton, Pennsylvania, there's a uh, place called, um, uh, let me think of it here, uh, McGuire Home. McGuire Home is a, uh, uh, it's not a hospital, I guess it's a care home, a convalescence home uh, for for children who have very serious uh, 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 disabilities. Yeah, we, we, and, I, I was going to say, we just call it a naughty boy's home, but uh, no, it's actually for disabled. Yes, yeah. uh, severely disabled. Not, not behavioral. And, no, no, right. no. Okay. And uh, uh, we, you know, as part of the build up to the uh, pay-per-view, we were going to be raising money to help McGuire home. And so I had a bunch of people coming to me and say, hey, we will do something at our business. We'll do something at our business. We'd like to pitch in. And there was a restaurant that at the time, I forget the name of it. It's, it's since changed hands a few times, but we had a wing eating contest. And so we sent like Big Dick Dudley, uh, Bubba Ray Dudley. Uh, I think the Pitbulls might have been there. There were you know, probably seven or eight of our, of our guys there. I was not there. And I forget who it was that came back. And said to me, like, they had this, like, look on their face. And they were like, yeah. I said, who won? And he, he said, you're not going to believe it. Like, he said, Joel Gertner was picking the wings up, putting them in his mouth, and pulling just the bones out. And he, I guess he ate, like, 75 wings or something. And he won. He beat Big Dick and Bubba and all the rest <laughs> of them. Is uh, I well, yeah, there you go. So, it, you know, applying himself in a, in a different way. Uh <laughs> But you know, the, 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 you know, again, if you go back to like the things, and I've, I know I've said this on your show previously, uh, you know, Bill Watts saying that at Thanksgiving dinner you want just a big pile of turkey, you want a little bit of everything. When I had left ECW to go to WWF and I came back, it was so different from what I had left. I mean, like really upside down different. Uh, me when I left again, you know, my pigheadedness was going to be the, the the nose to the grindstone wrestling company. Uh, when I came back, there's a black guy and a white guy in the ring with fake glasses calling themselves brothers. Uh, you, you know, you've got Joel Gertner with his neck brace on and you know, pudgy little kid that, you know, in, in the ring there. And I, it was just so like, what the hell happened when, since I left then, <laughs> you know, get, getting my arrogance out of the way and watching the Dudley's work. Okay. And then watching the eliminators work. Okay. And then watching, you know, Joel deliver his promos. It was like, okay, maybe I'll shut up and, and back off a little bit here and learn uh, that really was a, a, a huge step up in the product of the, that we were delivering at the end of the night. And in a way that was a little bit more mainstream to what the, say the main companies were doing at that time, not that we were copying, but a, a little more palatable and, and, you know, on the taste buds, if you're going to turn ECW on for the first time, instead of here, cut the fucking music and women getting bumped and everything else. Now suddenly you have a little bit of entertainment involved in it. But when these guys go, they could go. With uh, with that being said, the Eliminators and the Dudley boys, Bubba and Devon, um, I want to make mention of this, that Bubba actually had a broken ankle in this, which may go some way to explaining why. Because uh, when I was watching it, uh, the Eliminators took about 95% of the match and then they won clean. I was like, yeah, that was st yeah. stunning, quite frankly. I, mean, I don't remember the right. last time I've ever seen a match like that. Um, <laughs> right. I, I want to highlight and... You, you know, uh, jump in as well with uh, anything else from the match you want to bring up. But I want to highlight Perry Saturn because I always felt when I was a kid watching that Perry Saturn was something special that never maybe got his due, you know, more so than Cronus, uh, dare I say more so than the Dudley boys. I always thought Perry was great. Uh, yeah. He he could fly almost as well as Sabu. He had great suplexes like Taz. He looked insane. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to be so generic here, but give us uh, give us some stories uh, about Perry, but specifically how talented Perry was because I, I really rated him when uh, when I was young. I I agree with everything you just said. Uh, I had forgotten, you know, uh, you know Perry has been vast portions of my career, and then like we were talking last night at the building, none of us have seen him for forever. Last I saw him, we were me, Francine, Sandman, uh, New Jack. Perry, we were doing a sit-down uh, interview in Philadelphia, 
uh, he looked great then looked good. He was telling me the stories of you know, him getting shot in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, he'd, I'd heard stories that he had been homeless and then other people told me that wasn't true, but none of us has a, you know, a finger on his pulse. None of us know exactly where, where he is or, or what he's doing. And if you're out there listening to Perry, please reach out to me. Uh, I would love to connect with him. In watching that match last night, I had, was from 95 forward when I came back, I was intimately aware of, of Perry Saturn. But I got to admit, watching that match yesterday and watching how seamlessly he was doing some of those flying moves, I'd completely forgotten that part of it. And I think the reason is, is because when I first came back, you know, you can imagine from these guys, they'd heard all these stories about Shane Douglas and what they had seen. He's been gone. Now here he is back. You know, and like I said, he goes in our business, right? Perry wanted to see if I really knew what I was doing in the ring. <laughs> so they're having to the workout during the day and I go out and you know, he starts pawing around. We start playing and he starts going a little harder. I start going a little harder. And we end up going about a 25, 30 minutes, you know, chain fest back and forth in the wrestling, you know, in the ring. And uh, he came over and he shook my hand. He said, I didn't think you knew what you were doing. He said, he looked at you, he knows what the fuck he's doing. Uh, so, you know, there was that kind of relationship with us uh, that we had always gotten along. And and in some respects, there were times when we also butted heads. But, you know, Perry really did fit into that whole ECW paradigm. Uh, John Cronus, too. I mean, John, if you, you know, for anybody out there that didn't know John, uh, and watching him last night, again, the stuff, it's there in the back of your brain, but you watch it. You know, like I, you know Moose was asking me, last night, hey, you know, when's the last time you watch it god it's probably been 10 or 15 years that i've watched through that uh but you, you know so in time like you sort of like some of those stories and those memories get sort of locked in the back of your head someplace and watching cronus coming out and you know his pawning around with with uh perry and arms over you know over his head looking at the camera and you know playing off that and then getting into the ring and seeing how at six foot one or two 265 pounds he seamlessly moved around that ring uh, and when you worked with him, he was light as a feather. Like if you had to belly to belly him, it was just like picking, you know, a, a sack of potatoes up. It was, you know, simple. Uh, and, and just how jovial his character was. Uh, you know, it, 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 at times watching yesterday, there's a bit of melancholy because you're, I'm, I'm realizing this guy's gone, that guy's gone, this guy's gone. And 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 Cronus was one of those guys that was just so endearing. Like you liked being around him. And uh you know, and then being in the ring with him, when, when Perry Saturn first left to go to WCW, we were working in Wonderland in, in Boston, Revere. And uh, Paul had me booked against Cronus. And he pulled, rare for Paul to do this. He pulled me in and said, right before the match, he said, I need you to make him before you take him. Because it was going to be his first match as a singles. And uh, I was in my head thinking of a way, like, could we slide him over and somehow reverse it or, you know, steal it from him, uh, you know, elevating him a little bit more. And uh, we went out there and he was very, very nervous. It's the first time he wrestled in the singles in years. And I ultimately just said to him, just listen to me. We're going to have fun out there. And, uh, and he did. He listened to everything. And there's a point in the match where, like, when you have somebody that's hesitant and you see them starting to get more and more comfortable with you then it just sort of falls into place and i remember vividly in the match when that when that happened and it just became thump and then and, and just laying this match out and we got back and he gave me a great big hug um you know he had cleared that hurdle of being in a tag and finally could prove that he could do his singles uh you know but he and perry and watching that i, I my takeaway was the same as yours because i hadn't watched it in so long and watching them go over it it I don't, it wasn't flat at the finish. It just felt awkward at when the finish came, when it did in the way that it did. Uh, the, in hindsight, looking at it, you know, I was telling Moose on the way back, I wouldn't have done it this way. This would have been more backstage to me or whatever, but realizing that this was the first pay-per-view and, you know, you know, mentioned about Paul having to fight for his director and his producer uh, or camera guy, uh, you know, that was because those guys keenly understood the product. They, they were they were an integral part of the team. And they knew based off, like I said, with Joey and me commentating, they knew where if, you know, if Bubba's doing a particular thing in the ring, they know what's coming next because of they, they know Bubba's style. Uh, so in watching that, I, I was unaware until you just said it, that, that Bubba had the broken ankle at the time. 
And but he did seem to be moving around a bit slow in the ring for as much as he could move because that big bastard could move when he wanted to back then. Still can, but I mean, and especially dance. back then, undanceable. Yes. Oh it. yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, you know, but the match itself felt awkward, and then the afterbirth with Joel to me looked so ill placed. It looked so contrived. That should have been something that was done in a different way. But again, we're 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 sitting almost what uh, 25, 26 years later. And, you know, can play Monday morning quarterback, you know, with a pay-per-view, there's, you rarely have that luxury, uh, almost never. And especially in a company like ECW, that was just sort of, okay, that piece is behind us. Let's move on and get to the next thing on the list. Uh, the next, in fact, we are going to get to the next thing on the list. Rob Van Dam <laughs> versus Lance Storm. But before they come out, Chris Candido was originally meant to be wrestling Lance Storm. And he cuts an interview, not unlike an interview that you would cut in the sense that, you know, he's calling out people from other companies and, you know, yeah. all that kind of thing. One thing I wanted to bring up very, very brief, he sneaks this in. It's blinking or blink your ear and you'll miss it, if you pardon that expression, is that he said he can't talk about his girlfriend's name because Bruce will get mad. Did yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> did Bruce, I'm presuming Bruce Pritchard, yes. uh, did Bruce Pritchard have some sort of relationship with ECW where he'd call up and say, don't do that, don't say this? I mean, what do you know about that? No, my, not directly that I know of. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if there was a back channel between him and Paul. My The way I took when Chris said that, because I did catch it as soon as he said it, <laughs> uh, was that Tammy's working there, and if I say her name here, it might get heat on her there. Uh, that was the way I took it anyway. Uh, but in that promo with Chris, you can see what I saw in him. You know, they, I always thought that, you know, we, we've talked about this before, so I'll belabor it, uh, where Chris would resort to what he called the ha ha, you know, to get to some point and then sort of like go off in a joking or jovial way to sort of make it a little bit funny. Uh, to me, that if Chris would stay to that nose to the grindstone heel, my God, the heat he could have generated. And you see tinges of it in that promo, uh, you know, where, where he's coming in, uh, you know, and then almost like you, you see him catching himself, like he starts to get on that vein and then comes back and goes a little bit more towards the heat. The, the point is that with Chris, Chris could do all of that seamlessly. He could go from hitting the funny line and then a second later have you ready to choke him uh, and vice versa. I was not that nimble in my promos. My promos had to be pretty much straightforward. So like when I watch a guy like Chris being able to so seamlessly do that, there are things I dislike about the promos that he did. You know, a little bit of the, let me tell you something. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Those little euphemisms that every wrestling promo has thrown in. Chris would throw those in. And I didn't, again, not my cup of tea, but for him, for his style, that worked very well. Uh, and it, that whole promo, again, being in the ring, to me seemed ill placed. That could have been something that was done in the back. And I, to me, like the, you could see ECW's growing pains it, in well, this pay. Well, they actually right? don't have any backstage vignettes in the entire pay per view, do they? Everything seems no. to be in the ring, even including yeah. Joey's pieces to camera uh, behind the ECW flag in the Eagle's Nest as well. So, yes. yeah, th yeah, there's no big technical challenges as far as that's concerned. <laughs> No third camera. No third <laughs> so camera. we we had them all out there. It was, uh, you know, again, we, you know, with ECW, uh, understand that everything was hand to mouth, you know, so we didn't have, okay, let's send a couple of extra cameras in the back and shoot the guys in these live vignettes from backstage or whatever. Uh, but but to me, that that was what made part of that feel. When you watch ECW, like I was telling Moose last night, in going back, and for me, it was a pleasure to go back and watch this uh, because... I look at it and then I ask myself as I'm looking at it, does this look dated? Like as I'm watching this, does it look like it's almost 25 years ago? And, and the answer is no, it looks like it could have been recorded the night before. When you watch WWF or WCW from that same time frame, you can peg it to that time frame because it feels dated. Uh, I think, again, just one of those things, I wish we could say it was by design and we had planned it that way and see we were right 30 years later. Uh, it was be the, out of necessity. That's what we could afford. And I think it's a testament to Ron and Charlie, uh, Char uh, Ron Buffon and Charlie Brzezzi, that they were so good at what they did. Charlie, by the way, is the guy that's on the handheld, mm -hmm. uh, and he missed very little. I mean, if you, if you did that, he caught you doing it, right? Uh, and, and and Ronnie was upstairs with the, uh, you know, the, the, the hard cam, but uh, also then directing. And, you know, to do both at once is a pretty, most people that are, like, say, directing someone would say, no, 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 I don't want, I can't do a camera at the same time. Uh, you know, so there, there's, uh, 
a testament to those guys. Again, this the, the whole thing of ECW to me was every single person in that dressing room, from the men and women that were working our merchandise tables, to the ushers at the front, to the ticket takers, to the wrestlers in the back, to the guys on the cameras, everybody played their role and everybody lived up to that. There was nobody going, yeah, I got something else. I mean, I, you know, I got to go out in tonight and do something else. Uh, and that was all, I think, part of the big part of the reason that ECW succeeded. I, just to uh, draw the curtain back here a bit, I d don't know if you know this, is obviously I'm hosting this uh, with you, I ask the questions, but also you'll catch me looking down, looking at the next question, you'll catch me time coding every single answer you give, and you will also, and you can't see this, I flip the cameras every single time I talk and you talk. So that I is... It is a lot of work. It is weird. Yeah, so my mind's constantly whirring. But it can be done, but it is a learned skill. Um, afterwards, yeah. Chris goes, he promises he's going to be back later, and he is back later. And yeah. uh, very briefly, though, for some reason, he, he barely yeah. can play any part. Anyway, we'll get to that later. Rob Van Dam versus Lance Storm. Now, there's a uh, backstory with Rob Van Dam here. We'll get to that in a minute. But as far as the match goes with Lance and Rob, what do you want to say about that? Uh, Lance, I... I Huge respect for Lance, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Lance, as you know, uh, when you watch him, he is pretty vanilla, right, in, in character. There's not a whole lot going on there in character. What about just... that hairstyle he had going? <laughs> that yeah, rat tail. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Hey, we, we, there's also all, every one of us has some some hair moments in our past that we'd rather yeah, not. No, that's like Hall of Shame hairstyle. He yeah. dyed it as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, <laughs> hey, but he came in there, it, it, you know. I've always said I am so thankful I was in the ground floor of ECW because that would have been a really tough crowd to win over once they had gotten chugging. Uh, and and Lance came in there, albeit without that over-the-top franchise personality or that Candido delivery or, or whatever, uh, and he won them over hold to hold to hold. Um, not easy thing to do. Uh, the In this particular match, you know, and, and like you said, we'll, we'll talk about the, the Rob thing whenever you want to. But a uh, little bit of a story there uh, that did play into it, but wasn't planned to be played into it. Uh, Rob, you know, Rob was renowned in, in the ECW arena by then, right? He, the fans had known him and really had bought bought into him. And Lance was still relatively new at this point coming in. Uh, you know, so he hadn't had that huge monumental epic match yet in ecw uh but you could you know watch them delivering each other and and working with each other there's not a time you get a feel that they're dancing but there's a you get a feel that they're that they're competing and uh the, the one thing and I, we'll elaborate a little bit more on this in a second uh when lance picks the chair up mm -hmm. and uses the chair and he works the shot on Lance and you can hear the just yeah. from the audience and you know and I, the, when he went back to it later I said you know I'm, I'm watching but please let him lay this one in you know it's laid in and he didn't again and, and it went with it but but in, again I know what he's doing he you know he's in ECW he's heard all these stories you don't want to come in there and just start throwing taters around right and, and then think oh guy's stiff or whatever it, you could see like these two parallel universes in professional wrestling you know, the mainstream parallel and then this ECW sub world that somehow was a hair different than everything else. Uh, and he's going in there and doing that. But for his character, the way that he was portraying his character, it somehow worked. Like it, it somehow made sense that his character would do that. And, and you know, and, and it would elicit the response that it did. Uh, but, but, but do you think it, it was on purpose though? Because I, when I no. was watching it, I was thinking he was doing it very light on purpose. So he just gives a couple of love taps with the chair. So Rob doesn't sell it and then does the Van Daminator back. Maybe Lance Storm will tell me otherwise, but, or you'll tell me otherwise, but no, was that actually Lance yeah. Storm just not laying it in? Cause he, for whatever reason, he just didn't lay it in. I, I, I've never spoken to him about it. I, it. To me, it looks like he's using the chair, but afraid to lay it in because again he, where he comes from in the work you work this stuff you don't really lay it in uh and and of course you see but the problem with that was you know again like you know, given the different degrees of this there came a point in ecw where if you know if you put your hands up even to half protect yourself the crowd would boo you out of the building 
you know, with what we know about CTE and stuff now, and I, I not that I knew about CTE then, but I was aware that that's my brain. I sort of use it once in a while and, and it's fairly important. Uh, uh, I knew that that couldn't be good taking those kind of chair shots. And so, uh, you, you know, there was this point where it got to like an ECW, you could swing unless it was balls Mahoney swing in that chair. Uh, you were getting booed out of the building. If you in any way protected yourself, uh, you, you know, and, and, and the consequences that would have down the road. So uh, my take on it is, and again, I'm, I'm, I'll have to ask him the next time I see him, was he intentionally doing it or not? It looked to me like he was using the chair, but not realizing how to lay it in. And, but again, with his character, the way it was, and maybe that's Lance's brilliance. Maybe he did plan it that way and was doing it that way to play into it, but it, it, it whatever it was, it worked. Uh, it was, worked in, the, in, in getting the, the, the fans behind Rob and, and you know, a little bit more heat on him. Yeah, I'd love to know. Uh, hopefully Lance will hear this and he'll sort of clear it up. He's probably talked about it a load of times, but uh, I don't know the answer. Um, obviously, Rob Van Dam, say obviously, uh, it's, it's quite a famous match, more because of the uh, story behind it uh, regarding Rob yeah. Van Dam. Uh, he pins Lance Storm clean after the Van Daminator. But as soon as Rob gets into the ring, fans are chanting, you sold out and uh, something else where a can't read the quote i've lost it anyway that basically he's he's a sellout essentially yeah now yeah. uh this has been going on for i don't know how long this has been going on for but this isn't the first time i think the fans were chanting this at rob and the story yeah. going back then is that everybody including the dave Meltzer of the world had been reporting that rob was not long for the ecw world he was going to go to wcw at the time what do you remember of uh prior to barely legal uh this news coming out there, there was a lot of that. You know, at this time, there were there there were very overt attempts from the, the big two, WWF and WCW, to cherry pick out of ECW. Um, again, on the timeline, it, it's it becomes sort of scant, uh, sketchy to me. But my takeaway was in watching uh, both my experience in leaving in '95, and then seeing, like, say, the Public Enemy leaving. And going to WCW, where they became sort of this instead of this tag team that really you believed in, or you know had this humorous but to the jugular type of approach to the match. So suddenly they became sort of like the mascots. We're gonna get everybody dancing, and we're gonna you know like sort of the bushwhackers and yeah. and, and you know progressing out of the sheep herders. Uh, and and I think to a lot of the guys in the dressing room, there was consternation leaving because everybody loved being there. But again, it's hard to look and say, I'm making this much money here. I can make this much money there uh, and sticking around. So I, I can't recall exactly where this was in the timeline for, for Rob, but it was obvious that it, it was it was far enough along that line where the fans suspected that he was leaving and, you know, we're going to give him, you know, the the, the classic ECW send off. Uh, it, it, what it seemed strange to me was like when I saw him later come out with Sabu. And, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but that like threw the wrench into the whole thing to me, like where my brain was going with the, with the, the booking. And I can't recall, uh, and maybe, you know, I can't recall, was that by design by Paul uh, to, to get that chant earlier and then least expect Rob coming out during that match. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, when it's always reported in an industry newsletter, you never quite know who's fed them that line and where they're getting the information from. And if it's a right. work situation, but it was reported yeah. at the time that essentially I think maybe Paul had won Rob over. And it really was uh, uh, Rob uh, was going to go to WCW later in the line. I don't know how much they were offering. Did I write? I didn't write down or didn't find it out. Mm. Um, with that being said, the fans chanting you sold out. Mick, in his first book, talks about how, how much of an insult he genuinely took it. Mick Foley, I should say, excuse me. Uh, yes. w when the fans are saying you sold out, and it's like, well, you know, the fans, indirectly, they are to a point, but, you know, me staying here, the fans aren't going to pick up the difference in, as far as the paychecks go. <laughs> right, you right. know, I, I mean, what do you think of all the sold-out chants? I mean, did you take those to heart for other on other people's behalf? Yeah, well, I I got the none and us song, you know, yeah, whenever, yeah, yeah. Uh, whenever I left for WWF. Uh, yeah, there, there's, again, like to me, that was all part and parcel. We wanted the ECW fans to be interactive. That's why we encouraged them to bring weapons and 
uh, you know, everything into the ring and all those chants because all those chants, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, she's a crack whore and, and all the, you know, the other, that is the fans having fun. That's right. I mean, they paid their money to come in and have their fun. Let them have their fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but uh, with the sellout thing, it seemed genuinely personal to them. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I think so because, you know, there was a, there was a mindset in the ECW from the fans point of view that, and I think legitimate to some degree that we were there to, to join the revolution to, you know, we were here in part and parcel to lead that revolution and we're part of that revolution. And so now it's sort of like a few months ago or last year, whenever uh, Cody Rhodes left AEW to go to WWF, right? They're like, Holy shit. I know it surprised me because being one of the founding guys, uh, you know, there, it seemed like almost a bit early for that uh, misplaced. Is there heat there? You not, not quite sure of knowing what the whole story is. I think the ECW fans, because they were so bought in, did take everything personally. And and I would later use that or try to in some of my promos where I would say, you know, I hear you chant this, but I saw you and you and you on the front row of Monday Night Raw last week. You know, so who's the sellout here? Hmm. Uh, you know, and, and and sort of rub their face in a little, a little bit. Uh, you know, I, the fans, they, <laughs> in the arena there, to them, that was the end-all, be-all universe. That is the beginning and the end, right? The, the ECW arena. And not realizing that, like I said earlier, we we feel pain and we have bills to pay and everything else. And and if this company can't provide that to us and this company's going to offer something a lot more, then we move on. I took a ton of heat in a backward kind of way when I went to WCW instead of WWF after leaving uh, in 99 because, uh, you know, like at that time, everybody saw that character, the franchise character, be much more amenable to what WWF was doing at that time than, say, WCW. The truth be known is that the WWF offered me about 30 times what the WWF offered me. So, or WCW offered me 30 times what the WWF offered me. So, for my family's sake, that was why I went there. If Vince had matched that or topped it, I sure as I would have ended up in WWF. And at that point, I wasn't really in a position to say no to the bigger pot of money because I, after leaving ECW, unfortunately, Paul had really painted me into a corner with money that I was owed. Uh, and then a subsequent uh, declaration of bankruptcy. But, you know, back to the fans there, that was, I don't think there was anything really personal to them, like in, in saying like, oh, you know, fuck you, Rob Van Dam, you're out of here anyway. I don't think it was that. It was them having their fun and going to kick him in the balls a little bit on the way out mm -hmm. the door. Uh, because, you know, the damn very next week, if he came back and did a lights out surprise, the place would have lost his mind. Right. So, uh, you know, the yin and yang with that. But yeah. So. Back to the to, to the match between those guys, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, okay, uh, let us talk more about the match. We've talked about all the story around it, but the match itself, and specifically, you want to bring up Joey's commentary as well. Yeah, there was a point, and you know, again, after having not watched this for so long, and then watching it yesterday, I'm watching it almost with a fresh brain. And there's a, a messed up spot where Rob goes to, he's got Lance sitting on the rope and he goes to do a vault and like a leg lariat off the rope and his foot slips. And, and the crowd starts the, you fucked up chant. And Joey seamlessly pops in and set and cover and draws the cover says that uh, Lance was shaking the ropes. So he's, he's providing cover for Rob's messed up spot. Uh, and it was done in such a way that it didn't seem like, you know, okay, it's so overt that he fucked up. But by Joey saying that, you know, there was a fan at home going, oh, I didn't see Lance shaking the rope, you know, uh, or, or whatever. But it, it, it so seamlessly covered up for that, that it just, like it, it, me watching it, I saw the fuck, I went, ooh, heard the chant, and then I heard Joey's thing. And I actually had to, we had such a bad signal, but I kept trying to, re you know, back it up 10, 15 seconds to play it back for Moose and, and watching it in real time and then hearing Joey's commentary. And he did it again somewhere later in the show uh, where he, he provided the cover. Uh, there's We've all seen times when, say, uh, something so overt happens on camera. And meanwhile, the, the announcers are talking about something else. And it's so apparent what you're looking at a camera. You're not even paying attention to what they're saying. As opposed to Joey jumping right in there, not like shying away from it or pretending it didn't happen, but providing context to it and making it seamless. That to me is a great fucking announcer. <laughs> we shall move on. Mission Noku Pro Six Man, BWO Japan, Dick Togo, Terry Boy, and Taka Mission Noku versus Grand Hamada, 
great Sas- I think they pronounce it uh, Sasuke. Joey pronounced it, but Sasuke. I think it's actually Sasuke. And uh, yeah. as I wrote at the time, some guy in a green Robin Hood dress up costume who I've, ne- <laughs> who I've, I've never seen before. Uh, apparently, uh, some of the fans were chanting Green Power Ranger at him as well at one point. Yeah. Uh, his name is uh, Yakushija, uh, and he doesn't even have his own Wikipedia page. So uh, I doubt he was a, a big, uh, very much of a big deal, uh, even in Japan, I suppose. But uh, the streamers happen, you know, the classic streamers, for uh, which I think always looks yes. fantastic. And uh, yeah. Joey also mentioned that uh, Sasuke is jet lagged because he wrestled in the Tokyo Dome the night before against Jush, uh, Jushin Thunder Liger. Mm-hmm. And um, really too much to write down of what's going on here. It is, at the time of 97, really state-of-the-art high-flying uh, cruiserweight style. And I, I also wanted to make mention of Graham Hamada, who was 46 at the time, and he looked fantastic yes. As, yes, you know, for, for, yeah. for his age, especially. To be, he was moving like a 20-year-old out there. But uh, I, I'm sure you'll, you you can't pronounce or won't know 90% <laughs> of the moves they did either. But uh, it looked well-practiced, right. in my opinion. Not that my opinion matters, but what do you think of the match? <laughs> this, to me, represented uh, such a departure from what Americans were seeing in our wrestling at the time. And back then, you know, in 97, there wasn't a whole lot of people being able to, and th- at that time, being able to see, like, d- and uh, uh, New Japan or Mishinoku from Japan or, or All Japan, uh, other than with some tape trading and stuff, it's sort of this under swell of things that everybody was aware was going on else place, uh, other places on the planet, but we weren't able to see it like as easily as we could see, like, say, ECW or WCW or WWF at the time. But in coming in and, and what we would had previously seen uh, with, you know, the uh, uh, the Lucha guys coming in, uh, Ray Ray and Mysterio, and, or I mean, uh, 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 Super Crazy and all, uh, uh, all those guys, uh, very much in that style. And, and Joey even prefaces it that way and saying, you know, uh, very much Japanese style with a, with a uh, Lucha Libre undertow. And that was the same way I took it. There are things that I love about Japanese wrestling excuse me, and things that I don't. Same with Lucha Libre. Doesn't mean I'm right and anybody else is wrong. It's just I'm sure people say there's things I don't like about Shane Douglas's wrestling. Uh, I was, to me, it, it so represented what you were seeing from Japan at that time. Uh, my takeaway in watching it, like, like when I watch my son play football, I'm watching the semantics of what my son's doing. I'm not paying attention if you got a tackle or a sack. I'm watching his stance. Is his hips in the right place or his feet pointed in the right direction? Same as I'm watching wrestling. And my immediate takeaway in watching the Mishinoku match was that you can see how diligently the Japanese train. Everything is soup crisp. Bam, bam, bam. Everything executed like to the to the umpteenth degree. And what I don't like about the Japanese wrestling is this, this constant movement for movement's sake. It's just something's going on just to have something going on. Uh, I hate the tap in the shoulder and you run 25 feet that way and come mm-hmm. back for something. I understand why they're doing it in, in, in their style. It's personally not my, I would never do that in the ring. Again, doesn't make them wrong and me right or vice versa. Um, but I think that match, like you said, I was astounded at, 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 at the shape that some of these guys were in. I also didn't know the guy coming out, you know, in the, in the green Robin hood uh, uh, outfit. <laughs> but when you, when I saw him executing later, you could see that this was clearly a young boy. Somebody had taken a liking to in Japan and they're pulling into this six man uh, to, you know, to, to start to elevate him. And, you know, over the years in, in American wrestling, that happens all the time. And it happens in Japanese wrestling. Somebody comes in and maybe they get a job offer to something else and they leave the industry or get hurt don't want to pursue it whatever but that match gave the ecw fans in that bingo hall in philadelphia pennsylvania on that particular night in 1997 a morsel of what was going on in japan at the time and i i think that a lot of them took to that like you know okay this is what's going on in japan and you see this sort of love affair from a distance of, of wrestling fans here in america much like you see in japanese wrestling fans for what's going on in america uh, but that they were able to bring that flavor of Japanese wrestling and that crispness of execution. And, and you know, for me, looking at it as a, as a seasoned eye, you could see how the the young boys in the ring were paying respect to, uh, you know, to the elders in the ring, you know, and uh, but also how how those guys were executed. You know, again, like, you know, these weren't spring chickens. I think Mata was what uh, fifth, forty-six. I think they yeah, said forty-two. Yeah, f- f- I think Joey said forty-four or forty-five, but I think the reality was he was forty-six. 
Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, but in phenomenal shape and that the, 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 the Japanese culture, as you know, is, is steeped in respect. And uh, and you could see the respect the young boys were giving, even in the way when they were getting heat on, on you know, on, on those guys. You could see that there was that respect being paid. And, and for an older fart like me, I look at that and I you know I get that grin on my face because it, I, I vividly remember being that young kid in the ring, you know, and having to get Iron Sheik looking better than he really would be able to show. Uh, you know, and again, the respect factor of the business uh, that that match to me as as it felt sort of wonky being dropped in the middle of that ECW pay-per-view because of ECW being what it was at that time. But I also think it gave those fans, uh, you know, it's like going to dinner. You think you're gonna have pizza, right? And somebody comes out and has sushi there and you're like, well, I've never had sushi before. It's a little different. Uh, and, and that I think in a very big way was giving the American fans, uh, a little bit of flavor of what was going on in Japanese wrestling at the time and, and, and how precise they were in the execution of their moves and, uh, you know, it was just a, like a good cross section of Japanese wrestling from that period. Uh, I'm going to add a couple of things. Paul Heyman reportedly paid all six wrestlers and the referee because he brought a referee over as well twenty thousand dollars all in, including travel for the appearance. Um, mm. Sasuke pins Taka with a tiger suplex, a move I love, but I always go ah every time I see it yes. because I think the, the mm. neck's going to break. Uh, later on, uh, I think the next week, all six of the wrestlers go and meet with Jim Ross in the WWF. And eventually, uh, to, to do a Mishinoku Pro uh, WWF crossover, eventually Sasuke goes over for a few matches for the WWF, but they end up settling on Taka Mishinoku for their first lightweight champion, and then they build that catastrophically awful uh, uh, lightweight uh, uh, division in the WWF where they gave it absolutely <laughs> no, no, nothing to make it any serious kind of, you know, money drawing thing at all, aside from Brian Christopher, who was excellent in that. Um, right. Afterwards, we have Stevie Rich's black and white segment turning into colour, a very Raven-style promo, and we'll talk about Stevie probably in our next show now because we're running late on time. But then afterwards, and we'll probably end on this match, one Shane Douglas, the TV champion of ECW versus Pitbull number 2, Anthony Durante. Uh, Shane, uh, you, uh, I've written it as Shane, but uh, was led to the ring by Francine, looking stunning as ever, and three guys in black trench coats and motorcycle helmets with batons. They're your security, essentially. And uh, there's the Cut the Music promo. Yes. Claims credit for putting Extreme into ECW and calling out wrestlers from other organizations, as we said previously. Gary Wolf, Pitbull number one, is sitting at ringside in a neck brace watching. So, the match from beginning to end, uh, watching for the first time in 15 years, what did you think? Uh a little disappointed in, in what we delivered. Not as bad as I had had, had you know, sort of cataloged it in my head. Oh, really? Did uh, you did you imagine it as like an old? What did you imagine it in your head before debacle. you watched it? Yeah, I thought it was much choppier than it turned out to be. Uh, in reality, as I was telling Moose yesterday, so he, he's sitting off camera here. Uh, he'll hear this for the second time. <laughs> I had been on plenty of pay per views at that point. Uh, this is just in the night of work to me. Uh, but Francine and Anthony had never been on pay-per-view and in the build-up to our entrance they are getting more and more anthony was in the back just sweating bullets i mean he's scared to death and francine as we near entrance she starts to get really nervous and she right before we go to the curtain she said i think i'm gonna puke <laughs> and so when we go to the curtain the first thing i said to chris yesterday and looking at it is she recovered pretty quickly because when it comes to the curtain she doesn't look any of that uh Mere seconds before she's trembling in the back and like covering her mouth and you know, it looked like she's ready to pass out. And I think for all of us, like once you get into that position and you're out through that curtain and it just sort of takes on, hey, we've done this before type of feel. Uh I did notice that in the entrance, when she made her entrance, she didn't stop for the kiss. Uh and and the smoke hanging in the air, which again was indicative of ECW's lack of budget. Uh but the in setting the match up and, and, and again watching the match, this first last night, <clears throat> excuse me, it was the first time I'd watched this match in 15 plus years. When we set the railing up, or Anthony sets the railing up, and we're you know, we do the drop behind it, and I'm going to give him the drop on, on the railing. Uh, by that point, if you watch how he's moving in the ring early, shuffling his feet, moving pretty limber, uh, by this point. 
there's the heavy foot plotting dead giveaway. He's blown up. Uh, and he had blown himself up in that match because he was so nervous beforehand, right. probably wasn't breathing and, and moving along it, with nerves take over like that. It can really be detrimental to the match. And when I go to pick him up to do the, the ass bump onto the railing, you see his other leg instead of pulling in, which should be pulled up into a V his other leg sort of lags behind and hits the railing and knocks it over. And that's all, that's uh, all due to tiredness. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, being blown up, but also nervous. You know, he's not thinking of, of how he's going to move his body. Uh, when we later put it in out at ringside, you, you can see there's a, it, it, that's an attempt to get the match back on track. Uh, uh, in my head, I had sort of taken the match in a different direction because that spot screwed up. But now the railing ends up outside there. Let's, let's go ahead and pick it up there and maybe get Anthony back on track. We had the built-in luxury of having Gary at ringside and you know, when they get close enough, there's this fist of cuffs to which draw my guys over to it, which was so well done because I think when at the end of the match, uh, and, and I don't want to get ahead of it, but at the end of the match, when we have the surprise come out of the dressing room, I don't think that anybody in that building was thinking it was a misdirect. You know, they, they figured it was, you know, what they expected it to be. Um, but the match at second purview and watching it last night, wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was uh, because of, of of his nervousness and things. And I think both in Francine, I think, adjusted pretty quickly and got herself into the role. And it was a hard position for her to play because she's, you know, the whole time I'm selling for him, she's in the behind role. So she's got to be showing her concern that way. And I, she came off a little bit almost baby ish to me in doing that. But that's fine for her to do. And, and you can see her at points, she drops out. And at other points when she pops back in, it's almost like me with Steamboat, like forgetting that I'm in the match. Oh, yeah, and I'm getting into, back into the match. You can see Franny doing that. But this is early, early on for them. I mean, this you know first pay-per-view would be nerve-wracking for anybody, uh, especially in a company like ECW, because we didn't have the staff to, you know, to, to walking around and say having agents that could say, okay, calm down, guys. It's going to be like any other night. Things that you would typically see in the other, other bigger companies, we didn't have the luxury of. So, yeah. Uh, had to, had to go a different way, but not nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yeah, uh, Tell Chris I'll only be a couple of minutes. I've just got a couple of follow-up questions. I, I know he's looking there, <laughs> yes. grinding his teeth, trying to get the hook into you. <laughs> um, uh, Chris is, by the way, the owner of Appalachian Championship Wrestling. You know, the big, uh, the big uh, uh, flag behind you, so you know. Uh, with that being said, I, I remember watching it, and I th- remember thinking the crowd was very quiet. And I was thinking... That's almost indicative of the problem with the ECW crowd being overly smart because they weren't reacting to when you yeah. were both trying to essentially work on each other's necks to mm-hmm. uh, play into the storyline that you uh, broke Gary's neck. And right. any normal crowd with that kind of build I say normal crowd, but you know what I mean, any normal crowd yeah, with yeah. that kind of build-up would be more invested in the working on the necks, you know, three pile drivers on Pitbull 2, uh, 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 Anthony, you know, grinding away with the with the, with the guillotine, that kind of thing, and it's sort of almost yeah. the crowd that ruins it to a point because they're not reacting yeah. like a normal crowd. Yeah, they the ECW crowd by this time. This is when we, we're venturing and probably right in the middle of a period where if if you protect yourself with a chair shot, they were going to boo you out of the building. If you didn't get your head chopped off, if you, if a limb wasn't broken, uh, if you didn't bleed gushes of blood. Uh, they were sort of reticent. And in some way, I think, I don't think it was an overt thing by the audience. They were demanding more. And some in this ty- type of a match where the participant is at ringside, it's more nuanceable in what we're delivering in storyline. But nuanceable to what had transpired between me and this other guy at ringside. So uh, I, I think this was the period that, you know, that ECW fans had gotten, I don't want to say jaded, but they'd gotten spoiled. You know, they, 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 a lot of the guys that would come and the crowd would start to say, show antsiness or get quiet like that. A lot of the guys might start speeding up or, or, or giving to them, you know, letting them dictate the pace of the match. In this particular match, we had a very specific story that we had to tell leading up to that attack from Gary at ringside that then brings the Rick Rude character out. So, uh, you know, that there were a lot of culminating points coming up in that match. And unfortunately, Anthony was just like the side show to that. And, and that's not easy to deliver at times. I, I I think had that match been placed earlier in the show, might have received a little bit better uh, response to it. Uh, really difficult from a position of being the champion and having to d- deliver this storyline, still making Anthony at the time that this is all going to build to this attack by 
by Gary, uh, it's all nuanceable and that's hard to deliver sometimes. And I, I think the biggest thing to me was when in watching it was the fact that, uh, that Anthony was so blown up at that point. And you watch him, you see, uh, the sort of heaving and, and breathing and the plotting of the footsteps. Uh, and, and again, I remember vividly right before him because they had started getting me a bit nervous just because they <laughs> were so proxy. nervous, you know? Yes. It was <laughs> <laughs> a little nerve-wracking. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the end then. Uh, a uh, Somebody wearing a Rick Rude mask, who I swear, because I didn't realise it was going to be who it was going to be, I was looking and thinking, yeah. is that Terry Gordy under that mask? Because he's sort yeah. of got a <laughs> kind of thing going yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. And he's yeah. wearing the ravishing, simply ravishing uh, robe. It's meant to be Rick Rude. Uh, this yeah. masked man turns up, kisses Francine, who passes out. And um, yes. uh, you explain the rest of it and who came up with that. Yeah, she, uh, well, Rick, when he had come in, you know, you know, and there had been this whole, he's here to fuck with the franchise thing. Uh, it, it's it, everybody out there knows that the franchise character was a takeoff on the Rick Rude care pieces. Uh, the cut the music, cut the fucking music. Uh, you know, the, the similar character. I was always a huge mark for, for, uh, for Rick's work, a phenomenal in ring performer, uh, overly tense at times, but phenomenal in the ring, believable. And, uh, when as soon as I'd forgotten it, but as soon as Brian Lee came out of it, I you said Gordy, but I knew it was Brian and instantly just the way he had that jaw sticking out. And you could see the thinner, the thinner sort of not quite the Rick Rude build, the lean build and everything. And then as soon as I saw him about two steps out, I went, Oh, that's right. Rick takes off the the helmet and he's right behind. But when I said earlier about the nuance school laying out of this match, this is where we know we're building it too. That's the culminating point. Typically in a match, we'd culminate with the, the turning from heat to go home or whatever. Uh, this was a bit different in that sense. And so a little bit harder to carry out. Uh, but, but when Rick takes off the, the helmet and, you know, we, we just, you know, just mask or unmask uh, uh, Brian Lee, then these things sort of lay out. And then you see the, the presumptuous pop by the audience uh, finally getting what they wanted uh, out of that particular piece. Um <clears throat> You know, Rude was so so good at what he what he was capable of doing in the ring. The problem was by this point was twofold. He had already collected on the Lloyds of London uh, uh, payoff, and his neck was still fucked up. And mm -hmm. so Rick, excuse me, w was very frustrated because, you know, speaking as somebody who knows, you know, when you're that close to the ring and you can't perform, it's it, it's there's part of they you know you can do better than you know. You, there's that that ego part of it. But also the part that you're that close to, like an alcoholic in a bar, and you can't have that shot of bourbon. Uh, you know, being that close, you could see Rick when he takes that off, like he really wants to go, and you could feel, you could see his body reacting off the energy of the pop of the crowd. Uh, it was all there to lay out. Unfortunately, we couldn't take it where we would have liked to have taken it with Rick because of the the issues with his neck and the Lloyd's of London payoff and everything else. Uh, it was sort of like being like sexually aroused and not allowed to reach climax. That's if that makes sense with Rick rude. Uh, but boy, what a pop that was at the end of the night. And, and, and really, I think pulled all what I'd think were the loose ends of that match and tightened them together. And I think got us where we needed to get to uh, coming out of that match. Uh, having said that, Shane Douglas wins clean via pinfall. And on that note, we are going to shut down this podcast. Uh, we were a bit rushed for time today because Shane's got prior commitments. But next time we do recording, I promise we will get through the rest of the pay-per-view. Hopefully some of the questions are missed out in the first couple of episodes as well. Uh, the after birth of, uh, <laughs> of uh, barely legal as it is the fallout is probably a, yeah. a, a more polite way of putting it uh thank you so much for watching uh you can find i don't even know what day this is going to come out yet we haven't got a name we don't have yeah. a day for whenever we're going to put this out <laughs> but it's on podcasts everywhere you get podcasts whatever just search shane douglas you'll find it i'm sure we're on youtube at shane douglas whatever it's going to be because shane douglas or shane douglas <laughs> official we'll call it uh for now thank you very much for watching we'll catch you again next week and thank you shane for Cheers. taking us through great brother